Step 4. Interference with qubits. So we have seen how light interferes, how waves interfere, and even how single photons interfere. We can in fact see interference also with single qubits. Let's see how. Consider that we have a Hadamard gate and we apply it on the state of a qubit. So we will consider two states. One is our state 0, which is given by this state vector. Another one is 1, which is given by its orthogonal friend, 0, 1. And the Hadamard uh, gate is given by this uh, transformation matrix. If we start in the state 0 and apply the Hadamard gate to it, what we get, we have seen that already, is we, get a, an, we create an equal superposition of state 0 and 1. Now we can do the same thing again. We can apply another Hadamard gate to this superposition and see what actually happens. Applying the Hadamard to the state 0 creates another superposition of 0 and 1 over here, 0 plus 1. And applying Hadamard gate to the state 1 creates a superposition of 0 and 1, but this time with the 1 having a minus, uh, um, minus probability amplitude in front of it. So, after applications of two Hadamard gates, this is uh, our state. You can see that these terms, they both have a positive probability amplitude, plus a half, plus a half, whereas the other two terms have opposite amplitudes. They've got plus a half and negative a half. So the effect of that is that the probability amplitudes for ones cancel, whereas the probability amplitudes for the zeros, they constructively interfere. And we end up in a state zero, which was our initial state. And this works also for uh, uh, state one, if we use that as an initial state, but this time the cancellation of probability amplitudes happens for the zero terms, because they, ha they have plus one half, minus one half, and the one terms, they constructly interfere because both of them have plus a half, plus a half probability amplitudes. So this may not surprise you too much. After all, applying Hadamard twice actually applies the identity, which is doing nothing. That's because the Hadamard gate is its own inverse. So let's consider different transformations that do not have this property. In particular, let's call, consider two transformations. Let's call them BS1 and BS2. You can see that BS1 is actually our previous Hadamard gate, but let's just keep calling it BS1 for reasons that will become apparent a little bit later. And this BS2 looks a little bit similar like a Hadamard gate, but this time uh, the minus is not located over here, but it's over there. But you can check for yourselves that applying these gates in sequence it's not the same thing as doing uh, nothing. In particular, BS2 times BS1 is not equal to the identity. But let's see what happens. Again, we take our initial state. Let's say our initial state is 1. We first apply uh, the transformation BS1. And what we get is the following. We apply the Hadamard gate to the vector 0, 1. And after simple multiplication, we got the following state vector, which is just a superposition of 0, minus 1. And then we continue applying our gates. This time we apply BS2. And what we get is, in fact, another cancellation. You see over here the probability amplitudes corresponding to state 0. They constructly interfere, whereas the probability amplitudes uh, contributing towards state 1, they destructively interfere and therefore the probability amplitude for state 1 becomes 0. This minus term that appears here is not important and has no consequence because it's just a global phase. So we can just ignore it. Now, let's consider an optical instrument called a Max Sender interferometer. It consists of two beam splitters, which are BS1 and BS2 and two mirrors, over here and over here, and two detectors. And the games that we like to play with this Maxender interferometer is that we, uh, we feed in some light into the first beam splitter, and then we ask the questions, when will uh, D0 click, when will detector D1 click, 
what's the intensity measured at detector D0, what's the intensity measured at detector D1, and so on. In this particular case, we assume that we only have light coming in from the bottom over here, and that the uh, mirrors and beam splitters are set uh, in such a way that the path lengths are the same. Here, what can happen is the light can be reflected from the first beam splitter, bounce off the mirror and enter the second beam splitter, or it can be transmitted through the first beam splitter, bounce off the top mirror, hit the second beam splitter, interfere with the beam coming from the bottom branch, and either it will be detected at D0 and D1. If the path lengths are the same, then for this scenario, it will always be detected in, D, in this top detector D0. Now let's consider that we have, again, only a single photon entering our Max Ender interferometer. And then again, the single photon can be reflected at the first one or transmitted. It bounces off the mirrors, which don't really do anything. They just alter the path of the photon. And then it recombines at the second beam splitter. And we ask the question, does it get detected at D0 or does it get detected at D1? Also, the Max Ender interferometer implements our qubit. How? Where is the qubit? Well, if the photon is found in the top half of the interferometer, we say that it's in the state zero. On the other hand, if it's found in the bottom half, we say that it's in the state one. So here, the different paths uh, encode different computational states of the qubit. So let's consider our initial state to be in state one, meaning it enters our max center interferometer from the bottom half. And in fact, now you see why we have called uh, those previous uh, transformations BS1 and BS2. They correspond to the mathematical description of how these beam splitters uh, affect the probability amplitudes of uh, our qubit. And we proved before that if we first act on our qubit, on our initial state, with beam splitter 1 and subsequently with beam splitter 2, then we know that if the initial state is in the bottom half, then the output state will always be found in the top half, meaning D0 detector always clicks. But yet again, the situation is very similar to the previous step. Here, there is only a single photon found in the Max Ender interferometer. And we cannot divide photons, there's always just one. Yet, somehow, it knows that it has to interfere with itself and always goes towards a detector D0. Now, let's do a simple test. Let's actually put some absorbing material and block the possibility of the photon going through the lower half of the Max Ender interferometer. What do we see? Well, the photon can coming in here can get reflected. If it does get reflected, then it just gets absorbed and we don't get any clicks. However, if it gets transmitted and it goes through, it bounces off the mirror and it, uh, it is incident onto the second beam splitter, where again it has an equal probability of being reflected or passing through the beam splitter. Therefore, it has a probability of being detected by both the detector D0 and the detector D1. So what we have effectively done by blocking this path uh, of photon in the bottom of the Max Ender interferometer, interferometer is we have prevented interference from taking place at beam splitter 2. That is why we see both possibilities D0 and D1.